The scapula is a triangular shaped flat bone that lies in the posterior chest wall between the second and seventh ribs. It functions as a semi-stable mobile platform for the humeral head and the upper extremity to work against. The scapula articulates with the clavicle forming the acromioclavicular joint and the humerus forming the glenohumeral joint. It consists of two surfaces and three borders and these borders come together to form three angles. Here is the anterior surface also known as the costal or ventral and here is the posterior surface also known as the dorsal surface. This right here would be the superior border also known as the cranial border. This would be the medial or vertebral border and this would be the lateral or axillary border. This would be the superior angle, the lateral angle, and the inferior angle. The muscles that originate and insert into the scapula can be divided into the scapular stabilizers, the glenohumeral stabilizers, and humeral mortars. Scapular stabilizers include the trapezius, omohyoid, levator scapulae, rhomboid major and rhomboid minor, the serratus anterior, and the pectoralis minor. The glenohumeral stabilizers include the subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. And the humeral motors include the long head of the triceps, long head of the biceps, coracobrachialis, teres major, and the deltoid. And in this video, we will use a right scapula. Let's start with the anterior surface. The costal surface is directed anteromedial. The subscapular fossa is a shallow cavity that makes up most of the ventral surface. These oblique ridges are formed by the tendons of the subscapularis muscle. The deepest part of the fossa is the subscapular angle, and this is where the thickest part of the subscapularis muscle attaches, and is perpendicular to the plane of the glenoid cavity. The cranial border extends from the superior angle to the base of the cracoid process. The scapular notch is formed partly by the base of the cracoid process. The inferior belly of the omohyoid attaches to the cranial border next to the suprascapular notch, and this notch is converted into a foramen by the transverse scapular ligament, also known as the suprascapular ligament, and this ligament can ossify. The suprascapular nerve travels through the foramen. The axillary border begins at the lower margin of the glenoid cavity and extends to the inferior angle. Both the teres major and minor originate from the dorsal surface of the axillary border. The teres minor originates from the upper two-thirds and the teres major from the lower one-third of the lateral border and the inferior angle. The vertebral border consists of an anterior and posterior lip. The medial border is palpable inferior to the spine between the third and seventh ribs. The serratus anterior attaches along the anterior lip and some fibers to the inferior angle. The rhomboid major has a long attachment inferior to the spine and the rhomboid minor attaches at the level of the spine and the levator scapula attaches above the spine and some fibers to the superior angle. This triangular area is a smooth surface that allows the trapezius muscle to glide. The lateral or anterior angle is the thickest part of the bone and is also known as the head of the scapula and it ends laterally as a glenoid cavity. The head is surrounded by a slightly depressed constricted surface called the neck. The spine divides the dorsal surface into two regions, the supraspinous fossa and the infraspinous fossa. The medial two-thirds of the supraspinous fossa gives origin to the supraspinatus muscle and the medial two-thirds of the infraspinous fossa gives origin to the infraspinatus muscle. The deltoid works closely with the supraspinatus muscle 
in that the supraspinatus functions to help initiate the first 15 to 30 degrees of abduction of the arm. Then the deltoid does the rest. So the deltoid's ability to function depends largely on the integrity of the supraspinatus. Essentially, the supraspinatus helps unlock the arm from its resting position. It lifts the arm in the first 15 to 30 degrees, then the deltoid takes over. Raising the arm above 90 degrees is achieved by the trapezius, serratus anterior, and the rhomboids. The spine is a prominent portion of bone located at the superior aspect of the posterior surface. It merges medially with the vertebral border, and this area is known as the root of the spine, which is located at the third intercostal space, and the spine continues laterally as the acromion. The posterior border of the spine is also known as the crest. It consists of two lips that are divided by a rough area. The inferior fibers of the trapezius attach to the superior lip, and the posterior fibers of the deltoid originate from the inferior lip. The acromion is the highest point of the scapula. It is continuous with the lateral end of the spine. The acromial angle is where the lateral border of the spine meets the acromion and is located right over here. The medial border contains an oval shaped articular facet for the clavicle. The middle and inferior fibers of the trapezius insert onto the acromion. And remember, it is only the inferior fibers of the trapezius that insert into the superior lip of the crest of the spine. The middle fibers of the deltoid originate from the acromion, whereas the posterior fibers of the deltoid originate from the inferior lip of the crest of the spine and the anterior fibers of the deltoid originate from the clavicle. This makes the deltoid an interesting muscle because it originates from the clavicle, which is located anterior, and the scapula, which is located posterior. This allows the deltoid to move the shoulder joint in a number of directions. The acromioclavicular joint, also known as the AC joint, is formed by the articulation of the acromion and the lateral end of the clavicle. It's described as a synovial plane joint, and this articulation is held together by a joint capsule, as well as the superior and inferior acromioclavicular ligaments, and is further supported by a strong accessory ligament known as the coracoclavicular ligament, or CC ligament, which extends from the coracoid process to the undersurface of the lateral part of the clavicle. The coracoclavicular ligament consists of the coenoid ligament and the trapezoid ligament. The coenoid ligament is located more medial than the trapezoid ligament. These ligaments contribute to horizontal stability, making them crucial for preventing superior dislocation of the AC joint. This ligament complex does not actually come into contact with the AC joint, however, the strength or integrity of the AC joint depends largely on the coracoclavicular ligament complex. AC joint dislocations are often associated with an injury to the CC ligament. The coracoid process attaches to the scapular neck. It projects directly anterior. This area here is the apex. The short head of the biceps brachii originates from the lateral part of the apex and the coracobrachialis originates from the medial part of the apex. The pectoralis minor attaches to the superior aspect of the coracoid process, just medial to the apex. The brachial plexus passes medial to the coracoid process and deep to the pectoralis minor tendon. The glenoid cavity, or fossa, is pear-shaped and articulates with the head of the humerus to form the glenohumeral joint. It is directed anterolateral. The glenoid cavity is deepened by the glenoid labrum, which is a fibrocartilaginous structure that attaches to the margins of the glenoid cavity. The superglenoid tubercle is located above the cavity. The upper part of the superglenoid tubercle is continuous with the cracoid process. The long head of the biceps brachii originates from the superglenoid tubercle. The origin of the long head of the biceps is intracapsular. 
the infraglenoid tubercle is located below the glenoid cavity and this is where the long head of the triceps originates from. The origin of the long head of the triceps is extracapsular. Anatomists describe the glenohumeral joint as a ball and socket joint, but many orthopedic surgeons will describe it as a ball and flat surface. I think the best way to understand this concept is to compare the shoulder joint to the hip joint. The femoral head is tightly cupped into the acetabulum and held securely by a strong joint capsule. This configuration makes the hip joint more stable. In contrast, you can think of the humeral head as being applied to the glenoid cavity, and the joint capsule is thin and lax. Furthermore, the articular surface of the humerus is much larger than the glenoid fossa. These factors provide more mobility and a wide range of motion to the shoulder joint. However, they also make the shoulder joint more unstable than the hip joint, and thereby more susceptible to dislocation. Now let's talk about some of the tendons that support the glenohumeral joint. The joint is strengthened by the tendons of the rotator cuff muscle group. The rotator cuff is the name given to the tendons of four muscles, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis, and the teres minor. This makes for a very easy exam question by the way. The way it's usually asked is, which of the following muscles does not belong to the rotator cuff group? Most students memorize the mnemonic SITS, S-I-T-S. So right away, they'll know the two S's are supraspinatus and subscapularis. The letter I is for infraspinatus. It's the letter T that students often mix up, because the multiple choice will almost always have teres minor and teres major. So know that it's a teres minor that contributes to the rotator cuff. So these tendons fuse and insert directly into the joint capsule. The strength of the joint depends almost entirely on the integrity of the rotator cuff, namely the subscapularis anteriorly, the supraspinatus above, and the infraspinatus and teres minor posteriorly. The inferior aspect of the joint is the weakest, likely because it is not well supported by muscles. We should also be familiar with some ligaments that function to strengthen the glenohumeral joint. The first are the glenohumeral ligaments, which are three weak bands of fibrous tissue that strengthen the front of the capsule. There is a superior, middle, and inferior glenohumeral ligament. This anatomy is not constant. Sometimes the middle glenohumeral ligament is absent, leading to the formation of a synovial recess in the anterior portion of the scapular neck. The inferior glenohumeral ligament, or IGHL, originates from the glenoid labrum. It consists of an anterior and posterior band, as well as an, as well as an axillary pouch located in between. The axillary pouch is the thickest portion of the IGHL. The three components of the IGHL are thicker towards their glenoid origin than their humeral insertion. Sometimes, you'll hear radiologists use the term J-sign, which is seen on coronal MRI and MR arthrography. Basically, it's due to avulsion of the inferior glenohumeral ligament off the humerus, which allows for extravasation of fluid or contrast medium around the detached end of the ligament. If the injury occurs on the right, it's called the J-sign. If the injury occurs in the left upper extremity, is called a reverse J sign. You may have also heard of the spiral glenohumeral ligament, also known as the fasciculus obliquus. It arises from the infraglenoid tubercle and triceps tendon and attaches to the lesser tubercle of the humerus along with the subscapularis tendon. Furthermore, the transverse humeral ligament also strengthens the joint capsule. It connects to greater and lesser tubercles of the humerus. The caracohumeral ligament is a broad ligament that is about 2.5 centimeters in width and it strengthens the capsule above and extends from the caracoid process to the greater tubercle of the humerus. It works to prevent anterior and posterior subluxation of the humeral head. Release of the caracohumeral ligament may aid in the treatment of frozen shoulder. 
An important accessory ligament is the coracoacromial ligament, which connects two parts of the same bone, the coracoid process and the acromion. It courses in an oblique fashion over the rotator cuff and shoulder capsule. It functions to protect the superior aspect of the joint and is a final restraint to protect the humeral head from subluxing superiorly. Finally, I'll end with a few points regarding scapular fractures. Scapular fractures account for only 1% of all fractures and only 5% of shoulder fractures. This relative infrequency is due to two reasons. The first is that the scapula lies over the posterior chest wall and is protected by the rib cage and the thoracic cavity anteriorly and a thick layer of soft tissue posteriorly. The second reason is that the relative mobility of the scapula allows for dissipation of traumatic forces. The majority of scapular fractures affect the body and spine. The acromion and the coracoid process are the least fractured sites. Over 90% of scapular fractures are non-displaced or minimally displaced, making conservative management the treatment of choice.